Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Don. I'm an alcoholic. I want to thank Jim for those uh, that kind introduction. And uh, I have nothing bad to say about Jim. He's been a perfect gentleman, picked me up on time. And uh, I was walking down the runway, and he had that look. And I've seen that look before in airports. He's got that alcoholic look, you know. And, uh, <laughs> because we don't make signs, you know, because, you know, we have egos. Like, I don't need a sign. Why would I need a sign? Like, I'm going to sit in an airport with a sign that says Don L. like a goof. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm just going to look like this, you know. And, uh, <laughs> And I was on the phone with the sponsee, and I, I just walked by him. I knew it was him, and I just walked by him. So I'm going to play with him, you know. And I got about 50 yards away where he couldn't see me, and he's looking up the ramp still, and I called him, saw him reach, answered the phone. Don, yeah, Jim, where are you? I think we're close. Keep talking, you know. And just let him <laughs> finally turn around and see me on the phone. That's how you get to meet a guy like me. And I, I've been like that my whole life. I don't know what's wrong with me, you know what I mean? I just, uh, my wife asked me that. What, what's wrong with you? Why do you do, I don't know. I find it funny, you know. (laughs) I've never been, I've never shied away from a good time. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me and uh, the committee for inviting me and Beth doing such a good job of, you know, emailing me and keeping me tucked in and Jim and, uh, you know, and just just showing up and just, you can feel the energy in the room. I love the energy in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, the, God, you know, every time I come to a room like this, I like to, you know, at a certain point, just sit down by myself, just close my eyes. And just listen to the music of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, just everybody talking, nobody listening, you know, just. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, I, and I look around the room and I look at people I don't know and I look at their face and I go, I wonder what their story is, but I know your story. And I wonder what your story is, but I know your story. And I know we're the lucky ones. You know, we're in here tonight, we're safe, sane, and sober, and they're out there in the streets tonight and they're dying in Des Moines, Iowa. And I know that we're here and I know we come together to celebrate sobriety. And I know right underneath it, like the big book says, lies deadly earnestness, because we know what we deal with here. And we have a very good time surviving a fatal illness. It's, it's, it's astounding that we do that. Now, just for me, because I'd like to know who's in the room, do we have anybody in the room in their first year of sobriety? Show of hands, anybody in their first year? Wow, that's fantastic. That's great. <laughs> Anyone in the first 30 days? Anyone in the first 30? Great. That's awesome, buddy. That's great. And if you're new here and you're in your first year, you know, I want to cordially welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, that's what they did to me. It meant the world to me. And uh, it's a weird place. AA is a weird place when you first get here. It was weird for me. I mean, uh, everybody seemed to know each other. They damn near lived with each other. And they they laughed at these outrageous things. I'm at the low point of my existence, and they couldn't be happier to see me. You know, you come in with a low bottom, you guys light up like Christmas. Oh, (laughs) I've lost everything. Oh, that's great. (laughs) You know. Welcome, (laughs) and although it's attractive, there's a there's a repellent nature to it, you know. And I, boy, I didn't want to like you. I really that wasn't my plan. I didn't want to like you. You were just too you were too damn happy. You were too damn cleaned up. And I didn't think you were like me. You didn't look like me. You didn't dress like me. You didn't talk like me, you know. And you you seem to have a glint in your eye and a bounce in your step that I had long since forgotten. And if you're new here tonight, I know if you might feel a little out of place, you might feel like. Yeah, you know, we come up to you and we say, I know right where you've been. I've been right where you are. And you're thinking, no, you haven't. Come on. Who are you kidding? But I'm telling you, if you're new in this room tonight, we know a great deal about you. Even if we haven't introduced ourselves, even if we haven't heard your story, trust me, we know a great deal about you. For instance, if you're new, uh, this hasn't been a good year. (laughs) You know.
because nobody gets here on a winning streak, you know what I mean? And, uh, <laughs> my sobriety date is September 16th, 1991. I have a sponsor. His name's Vin Kays, 34 years sober. I have a home group. It's the SOS Men's Group. We meet on Wednesday night on 14th Street at St. James Church in the Fairhaven District of the town of Bellingham, Washington. It is a home group. It is a registered group. We're active in the service structure. We are men that are pulling in the same direction. There's a lot of energy and motion in that group, but we are pulling in the same direction. Some groups you go to, there's a lot going on, but they're pulling in opposite direction. A lot of inertia, but nothing getting done. That's not the problem in my group. My group, we average about 70 guys every Wednesday night, and the best thing I can tell you how we're doing is we get about 50 guys at our business meeting every month. Now, it's a real indication that the healthier group is your percentage of attendees that actually stay for the business meeting, that actually want to see that there's a plan in place for the new man when he walks into the room. And I couldn't be more proud of my home group. I just love that place. And, you know, John was uh, paid my, you know, my state of Washington a compliment, and he said, uh, God, you know, every, everyone I've ever met from Washington, they, they just seem really friendly. And I said, well, we did legalize marijuana this year, you know. <laughs> I just think everybody's stoned, you know. <laughs> it's funny, you know, where I, I work in the roofing industry, and uh, there was a little house on the property next to us, and they, they demolished the house about a year ago, and then they started building some structure, and we were all very interested to see what they were building. It was really a nice-looking building, and then they got the building built, and then they got the parking lot in, and then they hung the signage. It's a recreational marijuana store, and I just went, perfect, you know. <laughs> Don't have to go far for 12-step work anymore because they'll just be wandering in and out. <sighs> I was born in Hollywood, California. Hollywood's an interesting town. Hollywood's the kind of, well, if you ever drive down the street and you look out your window and you see something bizarre and you think to yourself, where? There's something you don't see every day. You never say that in Hollywood because you see it every day. And uh, if I wanted to take the time, and I, and I won't tonight, to really get into my childhood, you know, I, I have two. One of the gifts, I think, of Alcoholics Anonymous is if we come here and we do the work, we get to live two completely different lives. They're so different you can set them on other sides of the room. They don't resemble each other. We remember when we lived that way, but the life that we live today is so just completely opposite. And uh, I think if you do the work here, you also get to have those two childhoods. You know, I had the childhood that I dragged in Alcoholics Anonymous with me, which is very tragic. And if I told the story of that childhood just right, hopefully somebody in this room would feel sorry for me. And that was always my intention when I told that story. And it's a story about my dad deserting the family when I was two years old and we never saw him again, and my mom's alcoholism and the physical abuse and the gang-ridden neighborhood and uh, the poverty I grew up in and being seven years old and getting up to get ready for school, and there's my mom naked and passed out with my latest uncle, and i got to walk by that stuff to get some Cheerios and go off. And why I'm telling that, you know, your eyes are like, oh, yeah, oh, poor kid, and I love it, you know. It's just one of my four systems of propulsion, my big book tells me I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, and self-pity. And any one of those is going to kill me, and I love self-pity. woo Oh, man, if you can't feel good, there's nothing better than feeling bad, is there? <laughs> oh, man, drink a little whiskey, listen to the blues, and just think how they done you wrong. <laughs> Ooh, really fine-tune what they did. and oh, Just get ready to tell everybody to listen how it's not your fault. And the problem with being an alcoholic and a victim, and that's the way I showed up in Alcoholics Anonymous, is uh, every drink I take, I take with impunity because it's really not my fault. And I have that alcoholic bluster. Once you walk a mile in my shoes before you judge me, once you back off, if you came from where I came from and saw the things I saw, you'd drink the way I drank. And that stuff kept me sick and stuck in a bottle for years until I made it to Alcoholics Anonymous. And i got to tell you, if you want to stay a victim, if you're new in this room and you want to stay a victim, I'm going to tell you, don't get a sponsor. Don't do it. Because they will screw up your victimization too quick. They just... They seemed to delight in it. The more I complained about my childhood and my sponsor, the more he laughed. He just thought it was great. Oh. And she hit you with a stick. Because <laughs> <laughs> my sponsor got me to the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous and took me through the process of recovery. And I got down to the uh, 
steps four and five in the inventory process, and I did what the book talked about. I got down in black and white what really happened. And it was astounding to me the things I conveniently forgot on my way to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I had a mom that raised three kids on her own, never took a dime of welfare. Took two buses to work and two buses home to put food on that table. I had athletic coaches that took an interest in me, teachers that took an interest in me. What I found out through inventory is I had every opportunity to excel at the game of life any young man could have been afforded. And for whatever reason, I ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous, more dead and alive at age 31, had absolutely nothing to do with family or environment or those bad breaks or those misunderstandings. And the reason it's so important for me to stop being a victim in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous is I will die from the disease of alcoholism convinced it isn't my fault. And I'm so grateful for the steps that corrected the only mistake I can see that a loving God ever made in my case. You see, God made my eyes looking outward instead of inward. I've always had that ability to look out at the world and with 2020 vision tell you instantaneously with no effort on my part what you're doing wrong. And instantaneously tell you what you should be doing instead. But where my life is concerned, where the quality of my life is based on the quality of my actions, I'm a blind man in the wilderness. Absolutely no ability to look at myself. I did that inventory work. I did that. You know what I found out of my, my childhood? It was shocking. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> Because when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, it was not over. It was walking with me every day. And, uh, you know, I don't really have any excuse to be an alcoholic other than, you know, I don't get into the debate either. You know, was I born an alcoholic? Did I catch alcoholism? Is it a, did I progress? You know, the, I believe it's a progressive disease. I believe like any other disease, the progression is different in different individuals. In my case, it was very quick. But I know this, whether I was born an alcoholic or not, I know I was born weird. You know what I mean? Just, there's always been something wrong with me. Always been a half a bubble off plum. Just a little like, what's wrong with that boy? You know, what's, there's something wrong with the boy, Martha. You know what I mean? There's just something wrong with me. And, I, and I've got that irritable, restless, and discontent nature. You know, I, I don't have to go and learn to do an 11 step review. I'm doing my version of that when I'm eight years old, laying in bed, reviewing my day. And when you're pre alcoholic and you're self obsessed and you're self centered and you do the math, it never adds up, right? Does it? You never look at your day and go, that was a great day, little Donnie. It's always like, crap, I shouldn't have said that. Why am I so stupid? I mean, I've got this tension and this irritability of me. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I heard the definition of insanity. We take the same actions over and over again, expecting different results. And we're talking specifically about taking that first drink. I'm telling you, as an alcoholic, I do that with every area of my life. I've been doing that my whole life. First time I ever saw it, I was like five, six years old. Just a goofy little self-obsessed pre-alcoholic sitting in the sewing room playing with a bobby pin. Look to my right, electrical outlet. <laughs> I remember thinking, wow, this looks like it'll fit. And the... <laughs> Bam! And I got shot across the room. My fingers are smoking. My hair is standing straight up. And I remember thinking, did that just happen? <laughs> did that hurt as bad as I think it did? <laughs> Bam! And... <laughs> Now, based on the way that I lived my life until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I guarantee you I would have went for three, but I was unconscious. That's the only thing that stopped me. Because I do that with my life. I take the vehicle of my life, and I hit a wall, and I throw it in reverse, and I get a running start, and I hit that same wall. There's got to be a door here somewhere. Pain doesn't seem to teach me anything. My ego insulates me from learning. I hate not knowing how to do things, and the only thing I hate more than that is maybe you'll know I don't have to know how to do it. So I chuck and jive. I hide behind a shield of nonconformity. I don't want to do it. I'm a tough guy. And the truth is, behind that shield of nonconformity is a young man filled with fear. And there's something wrong with me, and I can't put my finger on it. And I got no relief. And I got no, no way to do with it. And I'm doing what society tells me to do. And I get out of high school, and I'm a graduating class athlete, and I got a 3.6 GPA and 20 scholarship offers to go play ball. And uh, everybody thinks that I'm doing great. And there's a storm raging inside me, and I don't have any words to describe it. I feel like something horrible is wrong. I feel like there's impending doom. I remember talking to my sponsor, and he goes, you know that feeling of impending doom? I said, yeah. He goes, you know what that is? And I said, no, what is it? He goes, it's doom impending. <laughs> <laughs> and I had done some drinking. I would had a beer here and there, and I don't care about my first drink, but I remember the first time I got drunk. 
you know, where I got enough alcohol on board in one setting to get there. Because alcohol, as much as anything, it transports me. It takes me to the land of I don't care. And my problems fall away from me. And the sharp edges get smooth. And I start to be able to communicate with you. And that wall that's been between me and you my whole life, this wall where you're trying to love me, I'm trying to love you, but there's something between us that won't let it get through and stick. The wall comes down. And for lack of a better word, I start to, I guess I start to have a spiritual experience. And I fell in love with the effect that alcohol produces in me. I love the doctor's opinion. I love the silk where it talks about the men and women drink essentially for the effect produced by alcohol. You know, we know what that effect is, don't we? But if you talk to a normal person, they'll give you a very different answer. And I've done it. I've talked to normal people. You know, what do you think the effect is produced by alcohol? And they go, well, you know, sometimes you have a tough day. Or it's a celebration. And you decide to have a cocktail. And you know, you have that cocktail and it produces a feeling of relaxation. And maybe you even hear the music a little bit better. You know, they feel that beat, baby, you know. And, uh... and then you decide to have a second cocktail. And somewhere in the middle of that second cocktail, you start to feel it, so you stop. <laughs> no, you don't. No, hit the accelerator. It's about to get good, I promise you. And, uh... But that's a normal person's reaction to putting poison in their system. Their body starts to tell them, I don't like this. I don't like the way I'm feeling. You should stop this right now. I have a different set of signals my body sends me when I put alcohol in my system. It's really one signal. More. More, 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 more. Let's more, 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 more. I, I have two drinks, and I don't care what the calendar says. It's New Year's Eve. I am excited. I am fired up like, this is going to be great. Dude, we're outside the liquor store. I know, but it's going to be great. You know. Where are we going? What are we doing? It's going to be great. You know, we got to work tomorrow. That's tomorrow, you know. <laughs> I've always been willing to ruin tomorrow for the promise of a couple of more minutes of fun tonight. You know what I mean? Just like, oh, love the effect produced by alcohol. But i got a problem with it. I can't drink normally. I can't drink to get there and stop. I have an allergic reaction. I have the phenomenon of craving. One's too many and a million's not enough. And I tear my life up and I tear your life up. And I don't mean to live that way. And I don't know what I suffer from. And the early part of my drinking is great, man. I'm going up the ladder in business. I'm dating up a storm. Alcohol's not letting me feel anything I don't want to feel. Not letting me do anything I don't want to do. I just, it insulates me. It's the armor that I wear to go through the world. And I love the effect produced by alcohol. And I know I can get through anything in the day because I'm going to be drinking that night. It's my reward for a day well lived. And I don't see that it's taken over my life. I don't see the spiritual and emotional and physical dependence that's growing day by day on the alcohol. I don't see that I'm losing interest in other things in my family and the good things in life and the things in life that, that money can't buy. And I'm losing interest in those things. And I don't see it because it's incremental. It's progressive. My alcoholic life seems the only normal one. And I get in trouble. And I get in a scrape. And I have the gift of self-knowledge. But because I haven't gone to Alcoholics Anonymous, I couldn't read your book, the book that says for the real alcoholic, he will absolutely be unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. So when I have that self-knowledge in a dirty motel room at 2 in the morning, and there's all that screaming in the room, and I realize the room's dead quiet and the screaming's in my head, and it's my voice, and it's saying over and over again, you're going to die if you don't do something about your drinking. And I'm 25 years old. And I make the resolution or the declaration that we all make that first time. I don't come to AA, and I don't get a sponsor, and I don't get a home group. And I tell everybody I know I'm quitting drinking, so don't try to tempt me. And I quit drinking without you, thank you very much, for two weeks. <laughs> and in that two weeks, all the things in my life on the outside start looking better. I start going to work five days a week. The laundry starts getting done. My family starts thinking, he's doing really well. And I think this is where the tentacles of the disease of alcoholism really start to spread out and really start to take pieces away from the sufferer's families and the sufferer's loved ones and the people that have the misfortune of caring about us. Because up until then, my family's having those backroom meetings about me, and they're saying, what are we going to do about Donald? He's drinking like a maniac. He's getting in trouble. And we go, I don't know. We talked to him. He, just, he doesn't get it. He says he's having a good time not to worry about it. I mean, I talked to him, and he said that everybody goes to jail once in a while. 
They don't, by the way, and I did say that. <laughs> and ignorance is bliss, and my family is insulated by the fact that I'm ignorant to the trouble I'm in, and then what do I do, man? I make the alcoholic declaration, and I tell my family I'm quitting drinking. It's killing me. I can't do this anymore. And they're having the back room meetings again. They're going, did you hear? Did you hear? He's quit drinking. No, he did it. No, he didn't go to jail. It was his own idea. No, he hasn't drank in like a week. He's doing great. And I give my family the worst thing an alcoholic can give their family when they don't have a program. I gave my family hope. And when I said it, I meant it. And they knew it was the truth because I meant it when I said it. And a week later, I'm all lit up. I thought you quit drinking. You promised us. You said it was killing you. And I got to make up a story. And I got to bring on my best friends, justification and rationalization, and try to explain to the people that love me the most why it's going to be different this time. Silkworth tells me what happens to a guy like me when I start stop drinking, when I put the plug in the jug and I just don't drink. He says, in very short order, I'm going to find myself irritable, restless, and discontent. See, the problem is I've hit the point where I have self-knowledge. So I admit, as Silkworth says, that it's injurious. I admit it's going to kill me. But the sensation that alcohol produces in me is so elusive. And what does that mean when Silkworth writes? The sensation is so elusive that their alcoholic life means, seems the only normal one. It means nothing gets it for a guy like named Don like a couple of drinks. Nothing. I can't make enough money, sleep with enough women, have enough people tell me I'm the man, go up far enough in the ladder of business, nothing kills the dragon like a couple of drinks of alcohol. Drinks I see other people all over the world taking, and they're not tearing their life apart. But I get in trouble, and I quit drinking, and I can't stand the pain of sobriety, and I'm confused. And everybody in this room, by the time they came to Alcoholics Anonymous, underwent a successful brainwashing. And they went under a successful brainwashing at the very hands of the people that love you the most and want the best things in the world for you. But we're dealing with people that don't understand alcoholism. And that group that doesn't understand alcoholism included me before I got here. I didn't know what I suffered from. And so the doctors and the lawyers and my family members and my girlfriends and my employers and everybody's saying the same thing to me. To a man, they're saying the same thing. You're such a great guy. You could be anything you wanted to be. You have unlimited potential. <laughs> if you could just stop drinking, everything would be fine. If you could just stop drinking, everybody would be happy. If you could just stop drinking. And I think about that and I go, yeah, I crashed the car, I'm drinking. Went to jail, I'm drinking. Lost the job, I'm drinking. Punched that guy, I'm drinking. It makes sense in my mind. It's the drink. It's the consumption of alcohol. That's the problem. So I stop drinking and I wait for the good stuff to happen and it doesn't happen. And I go insane in my own mind, which Silkworth describes as irritable, restless, and discontent. I mean, that's the biggest understatement in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got to tell you, it doesn't sound bad. It sounds almost clinical. I mean, I could show up at a meeting and John could look at me and say, hey, how you doing, Don? Well, I'll tell you, John, tonight, I happen to be a little irritable, restless, and discontent. <laughs> but it doesn't feel that way, does it? I'm irritable. I want to hurt you. I'm restless. I'm going to go over here. Nope, that's not it. Maybe I'll go over here. Nope, that's not it. Maybe I'll get some ice cream. God, I'm getting fat. You know, I'm just... just... <laughs> I'm like a dog chasing his tail, circling, trying to find the right place to lay down. Just circling, circling, sir. What's with Don? He's restless. No kidding, you know. And, and discontent. It's such, it's such a simple line, irritable, restless, and discontent. Discontent kills alcoholics. Discontent drives us back to the bottle. Think how bad your life had to be that the consequences of the actions that you took, the way that you were living, drove you into a place like Alcoholics Anonymous. How bad did it have to get for you to come here? Yet we see people driven under the lash of alcoholism Return back to the grinder a week, a month, a year, five years, ten years later. Go back to the very thing that drove them in Alcoholics Anonymous. And we try to explain it. Why does that happen? Oh, they weren't going to enough meetings. Oh, they weren't working with us. And we try, we try to explain it because it scares the hell out of us. But we can boil it down to one thing and one thing only. They were discontent. I bet you that. Because I've never seen anybody content in Alcoholics Anonymous go back to the grinder. You know... On the first page of A Vision for You at the bottom in the last paragraph, 
It says, now and then, a heavy drinker says, being dry at the moment says, don't miss it at all. Feel better, work better, having a better time. As ex-problem drinkers, we laugh at such a sally. We know our man is fooling himself. He's like a scared little boy whistling in the dark to keep up his spirits. He would do anything to take a half a dozen drinks and get away with it. He will try the old game again because he's presently not happy with his sobriety. People leave Alcoholics Anonymous because they can't take the pain of sobriety. The steps, working with others, a relationship with God, the things that we do here produce a contentment. You know, happiness is a moving target for me. I got to tell you, it's a moving target. Sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm not. I don't pay a lot of attention to it. Happiness, the needle of happiness, seems to be moved a lot by external factors. How much money I'm making, what kind of mood my wife's in, what's traffic like, how are things going at work. It comes and it goes. But contentment or discontentment are much more powerful. They are not affected by outside stimuli. When you're discontent, the outside stuff can't comfort you. And when you're content, the outside stuff can't bring you down. Contentment is what is promised us when we take the actions in Alcoholics Anonymous. And discontentment is what is promised us when we don't. And I've watched the discontent members of Alcoholics Anonymous walk out the door year after year after year, and it breaks my heart because I understand it. Because it happened to me in Alcoholics Anonymous, thinking I was doing everything that AA had to offer. You know, I came here like every good low-bottom newcomer with two lists. Now I got a list of the consequences that I took of the, you know, the actions I take when I'm drinking. It's the trouble I'm in. And it's on this list. You know, it's the warrants for my arrest. It's the 80 grand I owe the IRS. It's I haven't worked in a year, haven't had a valid driver's license in 10 years, on and on and on. And I'm thinking, man, if that stuff was taken care of, if I could get all that stuff off my list, I'd be okay. And then there's another list. That I, it's my dream list, you know. God, if I could get the woman of my dreams, if I could get a good job, if I could make good money, if I could get out of trouble, if I could buy a house, if I could do this stuff. And on the bottom of that list, there's a line drawn that says, equal happy. And what do you do when you're going to 10 meetings a week and you're sponsoring a bunch of guys and you're doing everything you think alcoholics not must have and everything on your list happens? And you get to the bottom and you're not happy and you're not content. And you have all the things that the normal people tell you, if you have them, you'll be okay. And I don't understand there's something wrong with my spiritual condition. And I'm walking around and I'm gritting it through and I'm going to meetings. I'm doing the things I'm asked to do and I'm five, I'm six, I'm seven years sober at Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm showing up in meetings. Guys like John are going, how's it going, Don? How are you doing? I go, oh, great. Couldn't be any better. Any better? I go on a shooting spree. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to re-examine irritable, restless, and discontent because I think that when I read that in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, we're talking about new people, Right? We're talking about when you quit drinking, right? But we got some time under our belt now. We've been here some years. That stuff's in the rearview mirror, right? Irritable, restless, and discontent. Not for me. I got to tell you, I stopped living by spiritual principles. I stopped growing along spiritual lines. I stopped taking the simple actions suggested in Alcoholics Anonymous. I am rendered irritable, restless, and discontent very quickly. And I got to tell you, I don't go pick up a drink. No, there's too much stuff between me and the door for me to just get uncomfortable and take a drink. No, what will happen is in my head, I will start to think that you're the problem. I'll start to think the wife is the problem, the job is the problem, and the, the city I live in is the problem. I will start to take an internal disturbance and look outside for what the stimuli is. The last place I ever look for what's making me discontent is inside. I always look outside at the things around me first. It's my knee-jerk reaction. It's my default setting. I hurt in here. There must be a problem out here. And I become irritable, restless, and discontent in sobriety. We talk about alcoholism, and, you know, I came in here under the brainwashing that my problem was that I drank alcohol, and I know the day that my, that was not my problem. That was my answer. Alcohol was my solution, not my problem. And my problem today is how to live sober, how to live life on life's terms, how to have, form a relationship with a loving God, how to do the things that are suggested here. Because what happened for me when I was 25 years old and I decided to quit drinking and found out I couldn't is I went on a six-year odyssey doing everything you read about in chapter 3. 
Vain attempts to control and enjoy my drinking. Brief periods of recovery, followed always by a still worse relapse. A feeling I was regaining control to discover I'd lost even more control. I moved to Boston in 85 because L.A.'s my problem. How can I get sober in L.A.? Everybody expects me to party. And I moved to Boston, find out, much to my chagrin, they drink in Boston. And I stay in Boston for three years until I wear out my welcome, you know, and I I come back to L.A. and two weeks later I get the best job I've ever had in my life. Not my best job drinking. I mean, to date, the best job I've ever had in my life. Alcoholics are amazing. We are like a cat flung outside a second-story window. Wow! Boom! We land on our feet in a three-piece suit at a job interview. (laughs) And we get the job. And the... We can get the job, get the woman, get the car, get the... We just can't keep any of it, you know? We just can't... And I lost that job due to my drinking, and I called up my sister Patricia in Simi Valley, California, and told her, uh, played the victim card, they'd done me wrong after all I've done for them. (laughs) And uh, my sister said, you can come stay at my house and get on your feet, but if you drink, you're out of my house because everyone knows I'm a drunk. And I told her I wouldn't drink it. When I said it, I meant it. But there's no room for the truth where the game of alcoholism is played out. you know. And I, I drank every day in that house for seven months until I got sober. And if you don't know how you're doing that when they're watching you, uh, maybe you're not a sneaky rat like I am. I, I got no problem drinking around your schedule. You know, what time do you go to work? 7 a.m.? Bars open. Uh, and... Uh, you know, and I'm not drinking to kid myself. I'm better looking or to feel that the, feel that my friends are nearer to me. I'm doing oblivion drinking. I'm doing light switch drinking. I'm getting the whiskey on board hard enough and fast enough to shut off my head so I can go into a blackout, so I can come to to face the hideous four horsemen in a room I'm mooching off of my family. Terror, frustration, bewilderment, despair. And I'd wake up in the morning or come to in the morning, and they'd talk to me in my voice in my head, and they'd make statements and ask questions like, who are you going to hurt today, Don? Who are you going to rip off today? You know, you've taken every good thing that's ever come your way and you've torn it to shreds. And now you're hurting your family and you're stealing from them. How's it going to end for you, Don? And I don't know what you do with a head like that when you're hungover, but I just took another pull off the jug. And I swear I'd surrendered to the idea that I was going to die drunk. I went up to my, I got an unemployment check a couple of days before I got sober. And I went up to my brother-in-law, Larry, and I said, Larry, I got my check. Can I borrow your car? And he asked me a funny question. He said, Don? Will you be returning this time? And uh, fair question, you know, I borrowed his car the few times that summer and got on them alcoholic vacations, I'd like to call them. And uh, the 12 and 12 tells me my outstanding characteristic is defiance. So I got right in Larry's face and said, How dare you? You know, the last time this happened, Larry, I apologized, you know. <laughs> I opened my heart to you, and uh, I don't really need this crap. And, Larry, untreated al that he was, took the keys out, and I snatched the keys from this man who I'm mooching a room off to leave his house to get in his car, and I remember thinking there better be gas in it. Just uh, <laughs> The delusions of entitlement that I suffer from just don't have boundaries. I go to the liquor store to cash my unemployment check because that's where drunks of my type cash our unemployment checks. And uh, I'm standing in line, and I have what the big book refers to as the thought that precedes the first drink. And it's always the same for me. It's like, ah, what's in a half pint? And I get a half pint, and I drink that in the parking lot. I decide to get another one, and I drink that half pint. And I think, you know, I can go visit those friends in the valley, and I'll be back in 45 minutes. They'll never miss me, and I'm gone. Three days later, I'm driving up the hill to face that family I'd done over one more time. Once again, I've taken their hope, their faith, and their trust, and I've torn it to shreds. And you need to understand that driving up the hill to see my family, I love them no less than I love them at this very moment. I love my family tremendously, but I can't serve two masters. i only got time to serve one. That's king alcohol. You get between me and a drink, it's nothing personal. It's almost business-like. I'm getting to the drink. I walk into a house that's been devastated by the disease of alcoholism. Everyone in the house is neurotic. Everyone in the house is fighting. Everyone in the house doesn't know whose side they're on. I walk into this home, I find out my brother-in-law wanted to report the car stolen and my sister negotiating down to a missing persons report and that the Simi Valley police are on their way up to do the follow-up investigation. Now, I don't know if you've ever been up for three days drinking and uh, doing outside issues, but the police usually aren't who you want to talk to. 
I got warrants for my arrest in two counties, so I start screaming at my sister, you know I got warrants, I'm going to jail, thanks for nothing, because now it's her fault. I go outside to wait for the police because I don't want the interview to go on in front of the family. I don't know what I'm going to be saying, but I am certain I will be lying. And uh, <laughs> Here comes the black and white up the hill, and on the side of the black and white it says, Canine Unit. And I think, great, they brought the dog. Like, like I'm in any shape to make a run for it. And, uh, and the cop got out, and he started asking me those hard, tough questions. That he is a trained professional, after all, like, uh, where were you? And <laughs> everything I remember is illegal, so I'm making up a story. And he's looking at my eyes really hard because they're rolling up in my head, and they're bloodshot. And uh, So he locks my gaze, and I break the gaze, and I look over here, and now he breaks with me. So now we're interviewing and talking. And uh, <laughs> my hands are wet. I don't feel good. And... Uh, I just want to divert his attention, and I see the dog in the back seat, and I said, oh, is that your partner? He goes, well, yes, it is, and he walks over and opens the door, and this dog gets out, German Shepherd, not a hair out of place, like a Rin Tin Tin reincarnate, and with no prompting on my part, he started to relay facts to me about the dog's life. The dog is three years past mandatory retirement. They can't retire him. He's just too good. The dog has participated in more arrests than any dog in the history of Ventura County. The dog has participated in more arrests and rescues than any dog in the history of Ventura or Los Angeles County. This dog was so phenomenal that the officers took a collection out of pocket to send him over to Europe for international competition where he kicked butt on German, German shepherds. Right? So, yeah. And I said, to the, I said to the cop, I go, well, that's a phenomenal dog you have there, sir. And uh, this thought flew in the back of my mind, the kind of thought, the minute you think it, you know it's the truth. You want to deny it, but you know it's the truth. And what the truth was is this dog had done significantly more with his life than I had done with mine. <laughs> I hated that dog. <laughs> I walk back into that house that's been devastated by the disease of alcoholism, and they want me gone. They can't look me in the eye. They've had enough of my act. My sister tells me, look, I know now I've lost you to the drink. I know you're going to die, but you can't die here. You're tearing us apart. And if I had any self-respect, any true partnership with another human being, any real love for anyone other than myself, I guess I would have said you're right, and you're right to feel that way, and I would have got my gear, and I would have cleared out. But I'm an alcoholic, and I'm not too proud to beg, and I beg for another chance. I put on an Academy Award-worthy performance, turned on the waterworks, and said, I can't. I got nowhere to go. I'll die out there. You've got to give me a couple of days, just a couple of days. I'll do anything. I'll go to AA and everything. And then wondered who said the last part. Because uh, <laughs> I've got to tell you, a day before I got here, I wasn't thinking about you. You know what I mean? It's not like my family really believed I was going to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. My, my first week in AA, my sister took me to AA and picked me up from AA. Yeah, that makes you feel when you look the way I look. And you get in your sister's car at the end of an evening of Alcoholics Anonymous. You get in her little compact car, 31-year-old loser brother, and she's going to drive you back to her house. And, so, Donald, what'd you learn in AA tonight? Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you about my first night in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was detoxing pretty hard, but I can tell you about my second night in Alcoholics Anonymous because I won the lottery. There's a lottery in Alcoholics Anonymous. It'll be conducted all over the world tonight in good AA. Men and women will win the lottery in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I won it my second night in there, and I didn't know that it was going to happen because I'm leaving Alcoholics Anonymous on my second night in there because, you see, I'm almost 48 hours without a drink, and I'm a daily drinker, and I'm physically addicted to the drug or alcohol. And I got my back against the wall in the Simi Valley Alano Club between the 6 o'clock and the 8 o'clock meeting at, at that place. And, uh, and I can't take it. You know, the, the threads are popping off of the fabric of my being. I'm shaking from the inside out. 
every fiber, every molecule of my body is screaming to go get another drink. These people aren't like you. You're always going to drink. You always drink in the end. What are you kidding? Why don't you bypass the pain? You're going to get drunk anyway. This isn't going to work for you. Nothing's going to work for you. And I got my back against the wall, and I'm trying to leave the, I'm trying to leave the hall. I got greasy hair down the middle of my back. I got a full beard with food stuck in it. I've lost the ability to speak the king's English. I communicate in a series of hand gestures, grunts, and clicks. I'm wearing my sunglasses at night. I got my arms folded across my chest, and I look dangerous. And I am dangerous because I'm terrified, and anybody that's terrified is dangerous. And they're staying away from me at the Simi Valley Alano Club, and they're giving me a wide berth. And they were wide to st- wise to stay away from this newcomer, and I don't blame the members that were at that group for staying away from me. And I'm not going to make it an Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm going to go get a drink. Because everything inside me tells me that i got to go get a drink and i got to go now. And it's the most important moment of my life. Whether I live or whether I die is going to be decided in the next few minutes. And I have no power to add to that equation. I only have one thing. I have untreated alcoholism. I'm 48 hours without a drink. And my disease is designed to do one thing and one thing only. To use my mind to get the next drink. And I'm leaving the Simi Valley Alano Club, and I'm going to get that drink. And although it's the most important me- moment of my life, and my life hands by a thread, over in the corner are two card-carrying members of Alcoholics Anonymous named Mark and Lou. And it may be the biggest moment of my life, but for Mark and Lou, it was Tuesday. And Mark and Lou were where they were every Tuesday between the 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock meeting at the Simi Valley Alano Club. They were drinking coffee, they were standing there, and they were watching the door. And they're looking for Newman, the 12-step. And the story goes that Mark said to Lou, whoa. And Lou said, yeah. (laughs) And Mark said, I bet we can't get him sober. And Lou said, well, we're here anyway. And, uh, And they did something to me. That saved my life. In fact, I think it's the most important thing that happens in Alcoholics Anonymous. I think it's more important than the format. I think it's more important than who's speaking. I think it's more important than who's dating who. I think it's more important than anything that happens in Alcoholics Anonymous. Two good card-carrying members of Alcoholics Anonymous took a 30-foot walk across a clubhouse and cordially welcomed a dying alcoholic to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Welcome. We don't think we know you. My name is Lou. This is Mark. Why don't you come sit down with us and have a cup of coffee? That nicety, that politeness saved my life. And you know why it's so important that Mark and Lou did that? If you expect this newcomer on my second day of sobriety to make that same journey over to introduce myself to them, I can't do it. It's a million miles. I don't have the strength. Don't you know what I've done to my life? Don't you know who I've hurt? Don't you know where I've been? Don't you know I can't get my eyes off my shoes? Don't you know the remorse and the shame and the guilt is hanging on me like a wet blanket? I hate myself and I can't be with you and I got to go get a drink. No, they knew I couldn't come to them. Mark and Lou knew they had to carry the message to the alcoholic and they did. And they sat me down and they got me half a cup of coffee And Lou clapped me on the back and said, Don, this is Mark. Mark will be your sponsor. And then he walked away. And uh, They assigned me my first sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know that's not done everywhere, but i got to tell you, my first home group, they used to say, oh, picking a sponsor is far too important a decision for a newcomer to make. And it makes a lot of sense when you hear it like that. And uh, Because we hear things in AA. We've been hearing them for generations. You know, they said it to us. Now we say it to the next people. We don't really think about it. Every meeting I go to in the format, it talks about sponsorship. Get a sponsor, get a sponsor, get a sponsor. And my favorite thing we say to people, find somebody that has what you want. Huh. I wonder what I want my second night in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Oh, I don't know, maybe a pharmaceutical rep with a spare Cadillac? That's a good start. Because I'd have never picked the weenie boy they assigned to me, trust me. Because he's everything I'm not, man. He's clean cut. He's wearing clean clothes. He's not profane of thought or tongue. And he has something that I have for nothing in the universe, let alone God and Alcoholics Anonymous, He's reverent. He has a reverence to Alcoholics Anonymous and God, and it's coming off him. And that stuff you hear in AA where we don't talk to the new person about God till they get their feet underneath them, man, my sponsor did not get that memo. 
Because the first time we sat down, he's talking to me about his God and what God did for him and what God did for her and what God did for them and what God was going to do for me. And he's expecting a miracle. He's on fire with Alcoholics Anonymous. And he got me busy in the program first night. He did it so matter-of-factly, I thought that's just what happened. I thought everybody got assigned a sponsor. I don't know. I'm detoxing. I got audio and visual hallucinations. I mean, I learned later that their whole thing was get them while they're sick. Get them before they know what's happening, you know? Get them before their rights are returned. They won't even know it. They'll just wake up and be a good AA member. You'll save their life. They'll thank you later. Hate you now. Thank you later. You know, and just... Without my permission, he gets this meeting director and he starts telling me what meetings I'm going to be going to. And he's sort of, Monday night you'll be here and Tuesday night you'll be here. And I'm, and I'm thinking, that's a lot of circling, you know? And, uh, and then he stopped at one point and he said, are you working? I said, well, no, I'm currently unemployed. More circling, more circling, more circling. Gets me a big book, 12 and 12 meeting directory, and then he insults me. When you sponsor somebody, try to insult them as quickly as possible. Get, a, get the relationship off on the right foot, you know. And, uh, and so he says to me, do you think you can go home tonight and not drink? Well, my God, it's my second day of sobriety. That's just rude. And I got upset with him, and I said, look, fella, any idiot can go a day without drinking. And he lit up like Christmas. He said, oh, you're going to be perfect for our program. <laughs> That should be one of our slogans on the wall. Any idiot can go a day without drinking. Man, my sister picked me up. I got in the car with all those books. She said, whoa. I said, I know. I think I got homework. <laughs> God, my, my, my second night with a sponsor, you know, he tells me what he wants me to read in the book. You know, and the thing about my sponsor, my sponsor... Everything he asked me to do, he was doing. You know, he wasn't a guy that told me to go take some actions and sat back and graded me. You know, he'd say, hey, keep me company while we're setting up this meeting. Hey, keep me company while we're tearing down the meeting. Hey, keep me company while we're making coffee. Hey, keep me company we're going to go pick this guy up. Hey, keep me company. He did it. He took me along and showed me how Alcoholics Anonymous was done. He was a program of attraction, not promotion. He walked me through and showed me how this stuff was done. And he got me busy now. He got me praying. My second night in alcoholics, or my second night with a sponsor, he sat down. He goes, are you praying? I said, no, I don't believe in God. He goes, that's okay. He believes in you. He says, well, well you know, this is what I want you to do. And he told me, go home tonight. He goes, get on my knees next to my bed. He goes, thank, thank God for keeping you sober. That's all you have to do. And when you get up in the morning, ask God to keep you sober that day. And I said, but I don't believe in God. He says, it doesn't matter. He goes, he, go, he walks around and he goes, Don. And he lifts his leg up like this. He goes, can you do this? And I, so I lift my leg up and down. I go, yeah. He goes, great, your knees work. You can pray. And that was it. That was the end of the conversation. And I remember that night, I'm sitting there, and I'm so embarrassed. I'm alone in the dark in a room with the door closed, and I'm embarrassed. And I think about that to now. I can't imagine going a day without praying. But the first time I did it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. And I'm on my knees, and I remember thinking, does God exist? Is this really going to happen? Am I going to be one of those crazy, you know, religious people? Should I be dressed for this? I mean, all the questions that you have when you're new. And he got me busy in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he got me a home group, and I got commitments at every meeting I would attend. He said, if you go to a meeting on a regular basis and you don't have a job there, you're a visitor. It only becomes your meeting if you're willing to take a small action of gratitude. The AA fairies don't come in here and set this thing up. It's dependent on us. And we carried our big books to meetings, and we read our big books, and went to big book studies and discussion meetings and question and answers and speaker meetings. And, man, he got, I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. It doesn't have to take long. I remember getting a 30-day chip in Alcoholics Anonymous, man, and I'm still a tough guy, and I'm trying to hold on to that, that macho facade and, they go to give me a hug and give me my coin, and I tell, oh, I don't hug. You know, and I take that hunk of colored aluminum, you know, I got it between my thumb and my forefinger, and I'm sitting there, man, in the meeting, and I'm fighting back the tears. And they're all grinning at me because they've been counting days with me. And, I, you know, I just can't remember the last time I went 30 days without taking a drink. And I don't want you to see how much it means to me, you know, because I'm so afraid to hope. I'm so afraid to hope that this thing could work for me. You know, I'm going home every night to a home that's been devastated by the disease of alcoholism. And my sister, who's a, she's a professional, she's a psychologist, she gets up very early and goes to work. And I'm so self-centered early in my sobriety, I don't even think that, you know what we do in AA. You know, you go to the 6 o'clock meeting, you go to the 8 o'clock meeting, then you clean up, now it's 10, 15. And then what do they do? Say, hey, you want to go to coffee? Sure, sure, let's go to coffee. I've only had 14 cups tonight, that sounds great, let's go get some coffee. What could be better than a cup of coffee? Coffee, coffee, coffee. 
And then we complain to our sponsors, I can't sleep at night. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm really tortured by my past. I think that's what it is. <laughs> Not the two pots of coffee I drink every night in meetings. You know, I'm rolling in at midnight, man, and my sister's up. My sister who wanted me out of the house a few days earlier is waiting up for her brother to come home from Alcoholics Anonymous. And she's asking me what happened in AA that night. She's asking me about my sponsor. She loved my sponsor. Oh, man, she loved my sponsor. I would tell her how mean my sponsor was. She'd go, oh, yeah? Then what did he say to you? She just, oh. Oh, he called you that name? That's great. <laughs> yeah. And I told, my, I told my sister about AA in Southern California, you know, that you... You get, a, you get a token, you know. They count days there, 30, 60, 90 days, six months, nine months. And if you're lucky enough to make it to a year, they'll bake you a cake. And they'll put a candle in and the light and they'll sing happy birthday to you. It's the most disgusting thing you've ever seen until it happens to you and then it's kind of cool. And, uh, and I told my sister that. And I remember coming home with that 30-day chip in my hand into a home that had been devastated by alcoholism. And I close the door behind me and here comes my sister around the corner. And she's got a cupcake with a candle in it and the candle's lit. And she's singing happy birthday to me. And she comes up to me, and I blow out the candle, and she says, look, I know you don't get a cake to you, you're sober, but for you, my brother, 30 days is like a year. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and it was a really nice, touching moment, but I didn't, you know, it took me years to really realize the significance of what happened. You know, here's a woman who's had a front row seat and has been severely affected by the disease of alcoholism. She's never been to an Al-Anon meeting. She's never been to an AA meeting. She's never read any Al-Anon literature. She's never read any Alcoholics Anonymous literature. All that's happening is a hopeless, helpless, hapless drunk is going to a room full of other drunks where the spiritual program of Alcoholics Anonymous lives and is discussed. And I'm coming home to a house that's been devastated by the disease. There's a part in the big book that says when a new man or woman come into our society, there's something about the electricity in the room, the light in the eyes that conspires to let the sufferer know that maybe they found haven at last. And I'm here to tell you. When we come to Alcoholics Anonymous, with or without our permission, the loving God that runs AA attaches himself to us and t stays with us as we go to our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. And we go back to these same places where we were devastating to the people that knew us and loved us. And suddenly, maybe there's something about the light in our eyes, something about the electricity that we bring home with us from Alcoholics Anonymous that lets our families know that maybe they found safe haven at last. Alcoholics Anonymous gave my family back the very last thing my disease took from me, which was hope. They didn't know why, but they were hopeful. There was something happening in someone that they loved, and they could see it in my eyes. They could see it in the bounce of my step. They knew I had found something, and they didn't have the vocabulary to describe it, and I didn't either. God had come into our life, and a miracle was in, on the way, and we didn't know it was happening. We just knew something sweet had entered our life. I was four months sober. My sponsor, man, my sponsor was like a ninja, Yoda, kind of like this really kind, sweet guy that would just slide the blade in. You wouldn't even feel it go in, you know, and he... <laughs> He just set me up. He goes, so, by the way, uh, what are you doing to say thank you to your family? You know, they're letting you get sober in their house after all you've done to them, and it's pretty nice of them. W what are you doing to say thanks? I said, well, well, I'm not drinking. He goes, well, that's mighty big of you. Listen, go home tonight and ask your sister if there's anything you can do. So I went home that night, and I said, well, my sponsor wants to know if, uh, if there's anything I can do to say thank you for you. And my sister didn't miss a beat. She goes, well, you can paint my house. And I said, your whole house? And, uh, <laughs> and she said, yeah. And I said, well, I, I got to talk to my sponsor. And, uh, <laughs> so I go to my sponsor and I go, man, this crazy woman wants me to paint her 3,800 square foot two-story house. And he goes, well, is she buying the paint? I go, I assume. He goes, ah, you got off easy. Paint her house. And he walks away dismissively. He always did that. He would just get the last word and walk away dismissively. I just hated it. And so I shout, to, I shout to his bald head. I said, hey, I thought this program was suggested. That was a mistake. Uh, I had no idea he could move like that. He uh, was back in my personal space before I realized it. And he's looking up at me, and I'm looking down at him, and he says, Don, you're so sick that I want you to think that anything that comes out of my mouth from this point forward, it's a direction. And we'll let you know when you've passed into the suggestion phase of the program. And <laughs> so I'm painting her house. And you see my, you know, and I tried to explain to him, look, I'm not even on the ninth step yet. I'm not even making my formal amends. He said, ah, you know, for you, we're going to make an exception. You know, they got a line for everything. You know, 
I'm telling you, the old timers of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, thousands of years from now, you know, they'll be studying the old timers of Alcoholics Anonymous like we study the great Greek philosophers. You know what I mean? It'll look at what the old timers said to us and it'll be like the philosophy of our generation, you know. And then he said to him, look into the mirror for there lies your problem. You know what I mean? Just where do they come up with this stuff? He, he just he had an answer for everything. But he was a student of the big book and he understood that my sister and I couldn't be in the same room together. He understood there were a lot of hurt feelings between us, and I had a lot of guilt and shame, and I didn't know how to make that right. And because he was a student of the big book, he believed the most important word in the immense process in the big book is the word demonstration. It's used in two different places. In the first place, it says, our man will be more interested in a demonstration of goodwill than our talk of spiritual discoveries. And then it says, it doesn't matter if somebody throws us out of his office. It's water over the dam. We've made our demonstration. And he believed in that demonstration of goodwill. He said, if you don't make that demonstration, you are going to be like the farmer that comes out of his cyclone cellar to see the devastated home to say, don't see nothing wrong here, Ma. Ain't it grand the wind stopped blowing? No, there's a long period of reconstruction ahead, and we must take the lead. A mumbling apology will not fit the bill at all. So he said, I had to make a demonstration. And so I'm painting her house. And I'll never know for sure what it did for my sister. She said it caused a great healing. But I'm telling you, the, the deeper I got into that project, the more I could be in the same room at the same time with my sister breathing the same air. And when I got done painting her house, it wasn't like we were even Stephen. But you know what? Alcoholics Anonymous and the steps and the spiritual actions that we're taught to take here gave me back one of my favorite human beings on the planet. And she's like my best friend to this day, you know, 24 years later. And I think about my sponsor and how wise he was to have me do that. Not talk to her about God, not talk to her about AA, but show her what God could do. Show her what God can do in a man's life. Show her the change in you. Don't talk about the change, be the change. And he absolutely insisted on that demonstration of goodwill in all of my amends. The way that he set me up on amends was interesting too. He said, everybody gets a call and everybody makes an appointment. And you make an appointment and you tell them exactly why you're coming. He goes, Don, we are handcuffed going into the amends. And I said, what are we handcuffed by? He goes, your perception of reality. He goes, if you drank as much whiskey as you say you did, who knows how accurate your fourth and fifth step is? We will never get to the truth if we don't have the participation of the people that you damaged. And you're going to have to make these appointments and tell them, listen, I owe you an amends. I've harmed you. I need to come and talk to you about how my behavior affected you and what I can do to make it right. And I said, this is a bad idea. <laughs> And he said, well, that's what we're going to do. And I called up and I made those appointments. And I'm so grateful I did. I remember making formal amends to my sister. And, and I get done and she goes, so that's how you think you harmed me. You stole my car. You stole my money. You think that's how you hurt me? I said, well, yeah. And she goes, you couldn't be more wrong. She goes, you don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like to love somebody as much as I love you and watch your life go down the drain year after year. When I ask you how you're doing, you say, couldn't be better. You don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like when the phone rings in my house after 10 o'clock at night. I know it's them calling me to tell me I'm never going to see my baby brother again. You don't know what it's like. I didn't know what it was like to love an alcoholic. And I'm so grateful for sponsored direction, for the humility that those steps produced in me. I never want to live like that again. I never want to hurt anyone like that again. And it hasn't been all like rainbows and puppy dog tails and Alcoholics Anonymous either. I mean, I got to... God, I remember, I, you know, I had my moment on the cross. I was probably five, six years sober. And I'd, I got sober. I made, you know, you should get a best friend in AA. And I got a best friend in AA. This guy, Greg, man, he was 30 days sober. When I walked in the door and we became fast friends, similar age, similar interests. And Greg was cool. Greg's the guy that we learned to live sober together. We learned to walk together. We went to meetings together. We, you know, we did commitments together. And we fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. We made that commitment. We would do this thing forever. We would do this together. You know, and Greg was my buddy. And I love Greg, man. And by the time I was two years sober, you know, I was having a problem with clubhouse sobriety. I started looking around for other home groups. I found a new home group. I started going to a group that's a little more, more active. And I went back to Greg, and I told him about this group I found. And, and, you know, Greg had started losing his momentum in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, he had dropped his meetings. He had gone from, you know, a meeting every day to four meetings to three meetings. He was going to about two meetings a week then. And I was still going to meetings every night. Because while I was trying to figure out what was going on in my program in Alcoholics Anonymous, I never stopped doing the actions I was taught. And it saved me. And Greg's down to a couple meetings. I'm telling him about this new group. And he goes, nah, man, I'm not interested in that. I don't want structured AA. I didn't get sober to have somebody tell me how to live my life. And I'm like, man, you got a plan when you got sober? Good for you. And, uh, 
and I get more involved in AA, and I'm sponsoring guys now, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, there's people in, in and out of my door all the time, and it's like, and I'm fired up, and I love AA, and, and Greg's down to a meeting a week, and then Greg's not going to AA anymore. You know, he's three years sober, he's not going to AA, and he's met this girl in AA, and they're getting married. I'm best man in their wedding, man. He's my best friend. And I'm talking about AA, man. I'm going, what, what's going on, Greg? You're not even going to meetings. Because, ah, you know, me and my higher power are going to be fine. I just, I just can't take the psycho babble anymore. I just can't take the hypocrisy. And he had all these reasons why he couldn't go to AA anymore. And I'm watching Greg's life on the outside, and it is awesome. It's getting better. He's getting promotions at work. He's making more and more money. He's driving a new rig. I'm hopelessly in debt. I'm paying back the IRS. Now the IRS, $80,000. I'm making like 10 bucks an hour with taxes taken out. I go into a payment agreement with the IRS. I'm going to send them 100 bucks a month. Never going to get out of debt. I remember writing the first check for 100 bucks, thinking, oh, good, 79900 to go. <laughs> but not Greg. Not Greg. Greg's killing it, man. He's making a bundle of money, and he's married now to this pretty girl, and he builds a custom home in the Antelope Valley. He's got two new cars in the driveway, and he's, he's doing great without AA. And I'm thinking, I'm the chump. I'm the AA chump. Look at my buddy Greg, man. He's out there competing in the real world, not wasting his time in meetings, helping people that don't listen to him, don't care. He's making all this money, and I'm going to AA every night because the old-timers tell me I'll die if I don't. But Greg's not dying. Look at him. He's three years sober. He's four years sober. He's five years sober. He's killing it, making all this money, wearing that nice jewelry, laughing at AA. Not Donnie, boy. Donnie's going every night, sponsoring up a bunch of guys, being activists, carrying the message wherever I'm asked to. And I think I'm the AA chump. I'm six years sober, and I got the call. It was my first grand sponsor. And he said, listen, man, uh, we got Greg here. He drank. It got away from him, and uh, he's asking for you. By this time, I'm married to a beautiful woman named Eileen in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, we jump in the rig, and we drive about an hour and a half to where I used to live and go to my grand sponsor's house. And we go in, and this back bedroom, this dimly lit room, there's four or five members of Alcoholics Anonymous standing there. And in the corner, there's a figure that I can't believe I knew because I never saw Greg drink and I only saw him sober. And he looks smaller than I remember, but I can tell it's him. And he's sitting in a chair and he's got his head down and he's rocking back and forth. And he's saying something over and over again. And I can't hear what he's saying. I can't catch it. So I'm moving closer up to him. And then I finally am able to hear what he's saying. And what he's saying is, is it time yet? Is it time yet? Is it time yet? grab my grand sponsor. I go, what the hell is he talking about? He goes, oh man, when we picked him up, first thing he did was he snapped a seizure. We can't get him into detox until six o'clock in the morning. We're giving him a thimble of vodka about every 20 minutes to keep him this side of seizure. He's asking if it's time for his thimble of vodka. Is it time yet? Is it time yet? And I watched one of the smartest, strongest, handsomest, coolest guys in the world who thought he was bigger than the game of alcoholism rocking himself back and forth to keep from flying apart, waiting for a thimble of vodka in the grips of alcoholism. And I thought I was the AA chump. And I sat down with my buddy Greg, and I said, Greg, what happened, buddy? He said, man, there wasn't a cloud in the sky, and me and, uh, me and the girl were sitting there, and she said, you know, we're not the people that came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, no, we're not. You know, And we talked about how much we had changed, and we decided that we could probably handle a drink. And we made an agreement, and if it got away from us, we'd go back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And so we went out and bought a bottle of champagne, and we poured two glasses and poured the rest of the bottle out just in case. And we had a glass of champagne, and we waited, and nothing happened. And we laughed, and we laughed at the fear mongers of Alcoholics Anonymous, oh, those old timers, and they said we'd die. And uh, two weeks later, I came home, and Kathy was drinking a beer, and I said, what's with the beer? And she said, it's hot. And I said, you got any more? And uh, a couple of months after that, we're drinking around the clock, and the job's almost gone, and the house is almost gone, and Kathy thinks that alcoholism isn't her problem, so she's back in psychotropic drugs, and she's drinking on top of it, and she has a psychotic break one night, and she tries to kill me with a butcher knife. And I lock myself in the bathroom with the phone while my beautiful wife is trying to get through the door with a knife and kill me, and I didn't know what to do, so I called the cops and told them my wife's trying to kill me, and I didn't realize when you do that, they send SWAT. And he watched his beautiful wife hogtied in their beautiful living room of their beautiful house and taken out past their beautiful cars and thrown in the back of a paddy wagon off the Civil Brand Institute to await arraignment on attempted murder charges. And I said, Greg, man, why didn't you go back to AA? He goes, buddy, 
we did. He goes, you can't catch lightning in a bottle twice. You know, when you kick six years to the curb and you have a bad day on day 17, you say, you know what, I'll just start over. We got sponsors. We started going to meetings, and we just couldn't stop drinking. We tried to get Greg into detox. We got him into detox. We had a bed for him at a treatment center, and Greg would not go. He left. He drank. We went to detox three and four more times until he shipped himself back off to his family's house. I haven't seen Greg's in the last 18 years, but I'll tell you what, wherever I go, and I look for Greg tonight in this room, I look for my best friend in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I hope he makes it to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous one day. He paid a hell of a price, but he was a hell of an example to me on what not to do in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I saw what happens to people that take this thing too lightly and think that they're bigger than the game and think they don't have to do this stuff anymore. And... uh You know, what can I tell you about 24 years? You know, I've sponsored guys the entire time, and I've been sponsored the entire time. And I didn't want to sponsor people. I remember the first guy to ask me to sponsor him. I met him on a 12-step call. I went with a guy with six months. I had six months. The other guy had 14 years. Guy with six months hit him with his six-month stuff. It was awesome, you know. Then the other guy with 14 years just lit him up, and that was just beautiful. And then I hit him with my six-month stuff. was like, I don't know. I haven't drank in six months. I got this tyrant I call a sponsor. I don't really like him. He tells me what to do, and... uh, I'm pretty miserable most of the time, and I'm hopelessly in debt, but if you want what I have. <laughs> and when we left, he was still drinking, so I thought it was a, you know, I thought it was a failed 12-step call. My sponsor said, are you sober? Yeah, it's, there's no 12-step call that's a failure if you stayed sober. So the next day, I get off of work, my crappy construction job that I suck at, where I have a nickname called The Bleeder. I mean, my life is just a <laughs> nightmare at six months sober, and... And this guy calls me up. He goes, hey, man, where's that meeting you were talking about? So I give him directions to the meeting. And I go, do we need to come pick you up? He goes, no, I got a car. And I think, man, he's doing better than I am. And uh, I don't have a car yet at six months. And so I got to run down to the clubhouse to beat the newcomer down there who's driving. And, and I get there, and he's there. And uh, he goes, hey, this stuff about sponsorship you talked about, you know, makes a lot of sense. And uh, would you be willing to sponsor me? And I said, I'll get right back to you. And I run across the clubhouse, and I find my sponsor, and I go, you know that guy from the 12-step call? He goes, yeah. I go, he's here tonight. He goes, that's beautiful. That's amazing. I go, yeah, he asked me to sponsor him. He goes, that's great. What would you say? I said, well, I told him I'd get back to him. He goes, I'm confused. Let me get this straight. He was drinking last night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But somehow he made it here tonight? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And he took whatever strength he had left and asked you for help? Uh-huh. And you said you'd get back to him? Sort of. He said, go say yes, you selfish bastard. (laughs) And he walked away dismissively, and I yelled to the back of his bald head. I said, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to kill him. He didn't even look around. He goes, ah, you got to kill a couple before you get the hang of it. (laughs) I mean, I'm hopelessly in debt. I don't have a car. I work construction for minimum wage. I'm living at my sister's house. What does this guy possibly want that I have? And I'm missing the whole point. He doesn't care about any of that. He just needs to know how he can go at night without drinking whiskey. And he knows that I haven't drank in six months. So we start going to meetings together. And we're in book studies, man. Every time the book comes to Donnie, Donnie passes. He doesn't read. So I got to do what my sponsor did to me. We participate in AA, man. I gotta, yeah, so after the meeting, I go, Donnie, we participate. When it's your turn to read, you read. And Donnie got sheepish and looked at his feet. And he said, hey, man, uh, I don't read so good. In fact, I don't really read at all. And I found out that Donnie was functionally illiterate. And, you know, you do that in polite society, you'd be so embarrassed, you know, wouldn't you? Like, oh, my God, I didn't know I'm so... This is AA, man. We don't care about that stuff. I'm like, Donnie, no problem. I know how to read. So we'd go to two meetings at the Simi Valley Alano Club every night, and then Donnie would drive me home because he had the car. And we sat in the front seat of the car reading the big book back and forth. And I would tell Donnie what the, how to pronounce the word. I would tell Donnie what the meaning meant. Donnie, like any good newcomer, would argue with me. And I would say spiritual things like, Donnie, you know reading dummy. I think I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and if you heard Donnie reading a meeting today, you wouldn't think that he went to Yale, but you, know, you wouldn't know that he came to Alcoholics Anonymous with that. I mean, whatever we have, we'll put it to good use here. I remember I used to feel so bad about owing the IRS $80,000. I mean, it just, it just would keep me up at night. My sponsor thought it was the minute my sponsor found out that I owed the IRS eighty grand, he put it into service in Alcoholics Anonymous. Seemingly for years. If any newcomer had the audacity of complaining about their little weenie $1,400 debt to the IRS, he'd say, hold that thought, Billy. Hey, Don, 
He called me over and said, Don, tell Billy how much you owe the IRS. I go, I owe the IRS $80,000. And Billy would go, Jesus. And I go, just want to be a service. And walk away. And... <laughs> we don't like self-pity here. We will not let you feel bad about yourself. Self-pity kills people. And I got married in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've made money in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've lost money in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've had marital problems and health problems. And this, but what I've done is I've stayed in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's been the guiding force in my life. Everything I have good in my life today, I owe to Alcoholics Anonymous, the loving God I found here, and strong sponsorship. I'm, done, I'm just an AA guy. You know, I go to work every day, and I work hard, I do, and I, do, I take the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I apply them at my job, and it seems to work good, and I apply them in my home, and it seems to work good, and I'm having a very good time, and I didn't see this good life coming, and I can't take any credit for it. I didn't come up with this. And around here, it's Alcoholics Anonymous, it's monkey see, monkey do, but you've got to find the right monkeys, you know what I mean? And I found the right monkeys. I've been lucky. I'm going to tell you a quick story, and I'm going to sit down. Eleven years ago, my wife hit the saturation point in uh, Los Angeles, and she wanted to uh, live someplace beautiful. And she wanted to live in the Pacific Northwest. And we live in Bellingham, Washington. We're 20 minutes from the Canadian border. We are America's first defense against Canada. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> and we live outside of town, eight miles out of town, and it's, it's in the woods, man. 200-foot trees, lake, biggest, fourth-largest lake in the state down there. And, I mean, it's dark at night. I mean, it's darkity dark, dark. I remember the first time I forgot something in a car, I didn't have the porch light on, and I just went wandering out to the car. I got halfway to the car, and a little voice in my head said, Cougar. And I just, you know, went, Ooh, just <laughs> ran inside, slammed the door, you know. And my wife's, what's with you? And I said, it's dark, darkity dark, dark out there. And, oh, don't go out without a flashlight. And we're city kids, man. We're from L.A. We're concrete, steel, and glass. And now we're in the woods, and it's dark, and there's deer. And then, oh, man, our first summer, the mama deers are bringing the spotted fawns, and we're losing our mind. Oh, my God, there's deer in our backyard. And we're just uh, snapping pictures and just, uh, f you know, breaking the law, feeding the deer, just everything you're not supposed to do. Stupid city kids. And, and uh, rutting season comes, and this one, this one little baby deer, this boy deer, just loved this guy. He was so cute and rambunctious and curious. He had a big scar across his nose, you know. Must have got into it with a buck or got into a chain link fence. And so we're city kids. We're naming the deer. That's Mama Deer and Scratch, Mama Deer and Scratch. And uh, rutting season comes, and Scratch starts to look rough. Like he's losing his fur all over the place. And I'm like, man, what's with Scratch? My wife goes, I know. And she, my wife is like that girl, man. She gets on the Internet and looks it up reports back to me that it's an affliction and it's called deer hair loss syndrome they get it in their first year and if it's bad enough they can lose all their hair and the winter comes and they won't be able to eat enough to keep their furnace going they'll get hypothermic and they'll die and i say to my wife i go scratch is going to die she goes yeah and i go oh not on our watch <laughs> And I lost my mind. And we're doing supplemental feeding. I'm throwing 200 pounds of cob and molasses in my Toyota Avalon at the feed store. And a guy's asking me, how many head do you have? I go, I don't know how many we feed. He goes, two. I go, I got two. I'm lying. And we're setting up feeding stations in our backyard. You can't feed the one sick deer. So I got deer coming from all over. I got 15, 20 deer in my backyard. I'm trying to herd the deer. Let the sick one eat. Get away, you selfish, no good deer. And I go to work, man, and I'd call Eileen at Scratch show up today. Yeah, how's he look? Not good. And I'd shake my fist at God. Not this one, God. And just, I'm obsessed with this deer. And this goes on through the winter, you know, and this poor deer, he loses all the fur in his body except from his nap of his neck to his rump. So he's got this four-inch mohawk, this fat beer keg, ugly, rounded out. All he can, he can barely move. He's so fat. And you know, all he does is eat and poop and sit in the backyard and... And we make it to spring, and Scratch doesn't die. And for the next three or four years, every rutting season, he would come to our backyard, this magnificent buck, this huge rack. And he'd walk up to my wife, and my wife would feed him apples by hand. And I'd sit there, and I'd watch that, and I'd think, what is it about that damn deer that made me lose my mind? And one day it hit me, oh, I'm that damn deer. I'm that guy sitting in the Simi Valley Alano Club, my back against the wall, dying from alcoholism, knowing I'm not going to make it, 
anyone with a glancing familiarity of alcoholism would have taken one look at me and said, that guy, that guy right there, he's going to die. And two car carry members of Alcoholics Anonymous sitting in the corner looked at me and said, not on our watch. And they did what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got to tell you something, Bill and Bob are gone and they left us a great legacy, but they're not doing the work anymore. And I know this as much as I know anything. It's our watch now. And they're coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, they're not here yet. They're close. They're finishing up their stories. You know, they, they can't take it much longer. And they're going to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, not even knowing what they're looking for, looking for something like blind men. And they're going to be out of hope, and they're going to be out of faith, they're going to be out of trust, and they, they don't think it's ever going to be okay in a million years. They're going to arrive in Alcoholics Anonymous in the same condition we arrived in. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, when they arrive in Alcoholics Anonymous, where will we be? And how will we be? If we're in the rooms, am I going to leave the stuff at the threshold of the realm of Alcoholics Anonymous that I need to leave out? Leave out my rights, leave out my personal problems, leave out my thing? Do I remember my primary purpose when I'm in the room of Alcoholics Anonymous where real 12-step work is conducted in modern AA? Or am I going to be cutting up with my friends and talking about the football game and talking about my latest deal and talking about what I did in my yard and talking about what's good on TV? Or am I going to be having my eyes trained on the door, looking for the new man walking in, giving him what Mark and Luke came to me? A cordial welcome to the room of Alcoholics Anonymous. Welcome. We're glad you're here. I don't think we know you. Why don't you come sit with us? Have a cup of coffee. You don't have to hurt no more. Are we going to carry the message of love and hope, or are we going to turn AA into a social club? Years ago, I was sitting with a buddy of mine, and we forgot what we were supposed to be doing in Alcoholics Anonymous, and we were cutting up, talking to each other, getting caught up, and an old-timer named Jim slid so quick we didn't even see him coming in. He came in and dropped his hands on our shoulders and said, That's okay, boys. We'll bring the newcomers to you. I hope I never forget Jim did that for me. You know, they're coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. They're coming looking for us. I hope we stay sober for 100 years. You know what I mean? I hope we stay and do this. But I hope we remember that it's our watch and they are coming, and it's our turn to do the work. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.